And that's something that I believe is that praise is supernatural. The issue that we have is, is many of us as believers don't believe we anointed. If the spirit of the Lord is in you and the scripture says that he is, you are anointed. When we make a decision to fix our eyes on the Lord and give him daily praise, no matter what is staring us in the face, we will begin to see the struggles lose its grip over us. I say when we begin to make a decision to take our eyes off our circumstances and fix our eyes on Jesus and to give him the praise, those things that are shrouding us, loosen us to the degree that we can now stand and give God praise. There's power in praising God. Well, a couple of weeks ago, the Lord ministered through me and gave us an identity, identified us as generation praise. Hallelujah. That's right. If you're part of gen praise, don't be scared to give him some glory. Some of y'all might not have been here or some of y'all not one of the ten. So, I, so there may be some that aren't, aren't one of the ten. Those that are one out of the ten know what I'm talking about. He blessed nine, only one came back to say thank you. How many one out of tens do we have in this place now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Generation praise, and, and we had some criteria that you need to uh, uh, live up to or criteria that categorizes the, the behavior that you would exhibit if you're part of Generation Praise. The criteria is that you thrive with details, instruction received from the Lord, that it's not about works, it's about faith, that you're changed in, in your situation while staying in it, and we don't leave when the going gets tough, and not afraid to be transparent, not ashamed to ask for help, understand the importance of gratitude, find solutions to problems, keep high expectations, want to make a difference, and openly exhibit emotions. If that describes you, more than likely, you part of Generation Praise. More than likely. More than likely. And so, even based on this criteria, I, I, I believe something and that's something that I believe is that praise is supernatural. Many of us don't think of praise as being supernatural. But I believe praise is supernatural. See, we praise God when conventional wisdom would say that's the last thing that we should be doing. We praise God when it doesn't make sense to do it. We see this through all of scripture, especially, especially in the life of King David. Now, and I want you to know that, that King David was probably the originator or the first example of generation praise. <laughs> and matter of fact, King David would probably be the king of gen praise if he were here. And he is in spirit. He was definitely a member of gen praise. Why do you say that? Well, there were times in scripture where he praised when it didn't make sense for him to. Saul was trying to kill him. King Saul was trying to kill the young David. And David actually fled into a cave, was, was worried for his life, didn't know what was going to happen. And in Psalms 57 verse 9, in that cave he said, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. This he said while he was on the run, scared for his life. In Psalms 56, when the Philistines uh, had seized him in Gath and, and, and he was surrounded and thought he had been captured. In verse 10, he said, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. He said this while he was under siege in Gath. Psalm 51, uh, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. In verse 13. 15, he said, oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Here was a man that was beaten with shame and guilt. Yet the first thing that came out of his mouth was, I will declare your praise. 
Psalm 63, when David was in the desert of Judah, in a desert place. Anybody ever been in a desert place? He said, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. He said this in a desert place. Some of us would have been only looking for water. But David said, I'll praise you as long as I live. There's another character in the Bible that I believe is also a member of Jen Praise. His name is Jonah. <laughs> Anybody know anything about Jonah? Jonah was in the belly of a whale. And in verse 9, while in the belly of a whale, he said, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. He in the belly of a whale. And still says, I'm going to give you praise. It's, it's, it's baffling. It's, it's supernatural. It doesn't make sense that for us to be or for these characters to be in that situation and, 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 and facing dire circumstances, facing life and death. And the thing that's on their minds is giving God praise. Oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah, praise is supernatural. I talked about it a couple weeks ago. Praise breaks chains and opens doors. Paul and Silas, when they were in jail in the middle of the night, they decided to, decided to have a praise break. Scripture says that the prison was shaken to its foundations and the doors immediately flew open and the chains fell off every prisoner. Praise is supernatural. Praise reveals solutions we can't see. Ooh, somebody needs to hear that. I said praise reveals solutions we cannot see. Anybody ever face something that you couldn't see your way out of? Am I in the right house in here? Well, maybe some of us ain't never faced anything, but keep on living. Praise reveals solutions we can't see. We, we have all had issues in our lives that we just simply can't figure out. These, these, these circumstances would sometimes tie us up in knots, but in Psalm 73, Verse 16 through 17, it describes this kind of situation. It says, I tried to understand all this, but it was too hard for me to see until I went to the temple of God. Then I understood what would happen to them. The, 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 the temple of God in this metaphor in Psalms is simply meaning that he came into the presence of God. And in the presence of God, when he couldn't see, now he could see clean, uh, clearly. I'm talking about praise being supernatural. Praise is supernatural. Praise lifts your spirits. Psalm 42, 5 and 6 says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Now, I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you. I'm trying to encourage somebody and let you know that praise is supernatural and something happens when you praise. Woo, am I preaching to the choir? I'm going to get to you in a minute. I'm going to get to you in a minute. Just hold up. So, Praise also causes the enemy to flee. Anybody got any enemies in your life? I got one, two, three, four, maybe. Let me tell you something. All of us have enemies in our life that we don't know of. So if you think you don't have enemies, rethink. But I'm here to tell you that praise causes the enemy to flee. The evil cannot stick around if we're praising God. That's pretty simple right there. If you're praising God, evil's got to go. First of all, he can't understand. The evilness can't understand. What, what you praising God for? Don't you know what I'm doing to you? <laughs> but you, in all of it, continue to give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You resist him by praising God in every circumstance. Do I have a witness about the power of praise in here? 
So where do we get the super? Where do we get the super to go along with our natural? Where does the super come from to go along with the natural? For a few more moments this morning, I'm going to talk to you about the topic of empowered to praise. Empowered to praise. Passage of scripture that I'm coming from this morning is found in Isaiah, the 61st chapter. Isaiah 61, starting with verse 1. Very familiar passage of scripture. 51 and 6 begins. It says, the spirit, this is Isaiah writing. He says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our Lord to comfort all who mourn. And then verse 3 says, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness or a spirit of, de of despair. The scripture goes on to say they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the water for the day of his splendor. Now, you need to understand something about that scripture. That's the very scripture that Jesus, when he came back from being tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, he entered into his hometown and went into the synagogue. And when he went there, he went on the Sabbath day. And it was his custom as they stood to read. They handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, handed it to Jesus, and unrolling it, he found this specific scripture. And after he read a portion of it, he proclaimed, Today, this scripture is fulfilled, is fulfilled in your hearing. He said, what Isaiah was talking about, I'm it. I am he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. The supernatural or the interesting part is it is that this is hundreds of years earlier. Jesus was introduced by the prophet in his own person. But he wasn't speaking about himself. <laughs> Isaiah got this revelation from God and he was speaking about Jesus, but he was speaking as, as if he was talking about himself. <laughs> I submit to you this morning that now hundreds of years after Jesus proclaimed that he was the fulfillment of that scripture, that is, is just as applicable to us as it was to Isaiah. The scripture is just as applicable to us as it was to Isaiah. Because now, in Jesus' stead, we are called to operate as Isaiah was called to do. Woo, that, that's, woo. We are called now, hundreds of years after, Isaiah was hundreds of years before, then came Jesus. Now we, hundreds of years after, can now operate in the same position that Isaiah operated in because that's what we are also called to do. I'll explain it as we go. Here's what I mean. Isaiah wrote, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Well, that's, that was Isaiah. Well... Today, we know just as it was with Jesus' disciples, we receive the promise that Jesus made. The promise was in John 14 when he said in verse 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him but it neither, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Isaiah said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord will be in me. Isaiah wrote thousands of years before Jesus, because the Lord has anointed me. Because the Lord has anointed me. 
But today we receive, accept, and believe the facts written by John the Apostle to Christians of that day when he said in 1 John 2 and 20, But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all you and all of you know the truth. In 21, he says, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies Jesus the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. You have an anointing. Isaiah said, for he has anointed me. Jesus said through the apostle John, you have an anointing. So here's what I need you to understand. When the enemy tries to conceive you of something that is contrary to what the Bible teaches, remember you have an anointing and you know the truth. All right, let me go over here. The enemy is always trying to tell you things that are contrary to the truth in the Bible. But the scripture tells me that I have an anointing and I know the truth. And so when the enemy comes and starts speaking in your ear, you need to tell him, I have an anointing and I know the truth. Y'all yeah. starting to get it. You ain't, you ain't quite clicked in yet. The scripture goes on in verse 27. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as the anointing is real and not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. I want you to do something for me right now if you believe it, and simply say, I am anointed. I am anointed. You see what the problem is? And the Lord kind of showed me this. The issue that we have is, is many of us as believers don't believe we're anointed. <laughs> because what we do is we, when we hear about somebody being anointed, we categorize that as, you know, um, you know spooky, you know what I mean, or... or Categorize that as somebody that's always up preaching or categorizes that as somebody who lays hands, has an anointing uh, to operate in the gifts. But I'm here to tell you something. If the spirit of the Lord is in you and the scripture says that he is, you are anointed. I, I'm going I'm, I'm to tell you something. I'm going to stay right here until you understand where I am. That's what happens to, to us so many times, Pastor Tanya. We, we hear what the enemy says, and so many times, because the enemy is constantly speaking, he's constantly putting things in front of us to say, this is what's really going on. This is what's really happening. You need to be fruitful of your life, because this is what's actually going on. And the enemy is always in your ear. I got something better for you. You don't need to deal with that. I got something that's going to make you feel good. The enemy is always speaking in your ear. But the Spirit of God says this morning that you have an anointing and you you know the truth. Some of you still uh, debating. Debating with the devil. Well, I mean, you know, maybe he's right. Well, you know what? I did kind of slip up a little bit last week. Nah. You have an anointing. You know the truth. Look at somebody and tell them, only if you believe it, say, I am anointed. Say, I know the truth. I, I ain't convinced that they understand, T. I ain't convinced that everybody got it. I ain't, I ain't, I'm not convinced. The enemy is going to continue to speak into your life. The enemy is going to continue to try to lead you down paths that you don't want to go down. The enemy is going to continue to try to trip you up because he wants you to believe 
that he knows the truth. But let me tell you something. Every time you tell the devil the devil is a liar, you can only say that because you are anointed and you know the truth. Anybody ever said that? The devil is a liar. I know my wife, she, and she have attitude. She has stank on hers when she said, the devil is a liar. Whenever you profess that, that tells me and it tells the Lord that you know the truth from a lie and that you are Somebody give God praise if you believe you're anointed. I, 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 I'm not really convinced yet, but. Woo. Lord, help me with this one. Can I go a little deeper? It's the times when you don't recognize the anointing that the enemy has an opportunity to slip in. It's times like these when you hear the truth and you know the truth, but you only catch it at 75%. Man, I, I'm, I'm I, You only catching it like 75%. Well, I'm anointed some of the time, but other times I ain't trying to be anointed. I hear, some, I hear somebody. 75% of the time I'm anointed and I want to be anointed. But there's that 25%. <laughs> I ain't trying to be anointed, Pastor Dot. And that's going to catch up with you every time. That's going to slip you up every time. That 25% will negate the 75%. All right, let me keep going. I'm out of time. I'm almost out of time. Say it again. I am anointed. Hallelujah. The only reason you could say that the Lord told me or the Holy Spirit said is because you are anointed and you know the truth. I don't know about you, but I won't be deceived by the lie. I won't be deceived by the trick of the enemy. I am anointed. That word anointed means to smear. I'm going to have to close on this. I'm going to have to close on this. That word anointing means to smear. <sighs> smear oil. So when somebody is anointed, uh, when, when it was a king or a priest, they normally would, would pour oil on a person's head. And that oil would drip down into their beard all the way down. But there is another, uh, uh, there is another definition of anointed that means to smear. Mm. Smear. My wife tells me back in the day when I was drunk all the time, high all the time. I would come home, sleep, passed out, and she would grab the oil and smear. I wake up, I'm greasy. I'm, what in the world is... She ain't said a word. She like, don't look at me. <laughs> Smear. I, I, I continue to research that, that word anointed and the oil being smeared. And, and I, I found out um, that, that there was an occasion in Isaiah 21 and 5 where it says, uh, talking about some revelers, if you will, some that were, that were on a raid. He says, they set the tables, they spread the rugs, they eat, they drink. And then it says, get up, you officers, oil your seals. Oil your seals. Now, now that scripture was said uh, because, you know, the, 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 the people that were doing that, they would rather be uh, more content eating uh, and drinking than to prepare their seals. Because when you oil your seal, the seal was thought of to cover be covered with leather which is oiled and they would oil the shield partly to protect it from wet conditions and then partly to make the stroke of the sword glide off of it <laughs> uh, they would oil the shield to make the stroke of the sword slide off of it 
You see, they used to anoint their seals. Oh, my God. They used to anoint their seals. They would anoint their seals with oil to preserve and polish them and to make them slippery. That their enemy's darts may not fix in and penetrate, but slide right off of them. I'm here to tell you something this morning. Not only are we equipped with the full armor of God, but our weapons are anointed. I said our weapons are anointed. My shield is all up. I was, I was in prayer. And I was in prayer and the Lord was giving me a tongue. It was like... Uh, pew, 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 pew. And the spirit of the Lord gave me a revelation that those were just the fiery darts of the enemy that were hitting against my anointed shield and dropping off as they hit me. And so they were falling on beside me. And when I looked back, I saw all the darts of the enemy. I saw the, all the arrows on the ground. None hit me because my shield is anointed in Jesus name. My shield is anointed. That belt of truth buckled around my waist is anointed. That breastplate of righteousness is anointed. Hallelujah. I'm fitted with the readiness of the preparation of the gospel of peace on my feet. They are anointed. Hallelujah. The helmet of salvation, it's anointed. Ah! Sword of the spirit is anointed. Ah, can I keep going just for a minute? I know I'm out of time. But along with the anointing comes the garment of praise. <laughs> along with the anointing comes the garment of praise. Scripture says that, that Isaiah, in speaking of Jesus, would bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of despair. Beauty for ashes, that crown for ashes, that crown is simply represents uh, a diadem, if you will, that would take the place of the, of the customary ashes that they would sprinkle on their own heads when they were in despair. The oil of joy for mourning is actually speaking of the anointing of the spirit in lieu of the plenteousness of tears, which naturally belong to mourners. Then finally, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness it's, or a glad heart inclined to praise in lieu of a heavy one inclined to despair. See, in the natural, the garment of praise would be like a, a, a bright colored garment, multicolored garment, which is indicative of thankfulness instead of those that indicate despondency as in sackcloth, sackcloth, I'm sorry. The spirit of the Lord was upon him and had anointed him to bestow this upon me. And so the last thing that he bestowed was the garment of praise. He said that he was going to give us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, which indicates there is an exchange that takes place. There is an exchange that takes place. This exchange can take place on demand <laughs> once the anointing is realized. Once you realize you're anointed, you can exchange that heaviness for the garment of praise on demand. <laughs> I said on demand, in the, in, in, in the midst of your sorrow, in, in the midst of your despair, in the midst of your trouble. If you are anointed on demand, you can say, I switch that thing. I take off that garment of heaviness and I put on the garment of praise and I begin to praise the Lord on demand. If you're anointed. Any, any anointed folks we got out there? If you're anointed. We've all been there. We sometimes experience the spirit of heaviness that will try to cloak you when afflictions come. When you feel you're under the sense of, of guilt and sin. And your, your heart is heavy. But I'm here to tell you, but instead of allowing the spirit of sorrow to shroud you and affect your mood and actions, take it off. Take it off. Take off that spirit of heaviness. 
Get out from under it and put on your garment of praise. Don't worry, that's the only thing I'm going to take off up here. Take it off, I said. Look at somebody say, take it off. Take that spirit of heaviness off. Take it, say, say, take it off. Take that spirit of defeat off. Come on, say, 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 take it off now. No, no, you look, look at somebody say, I said, take it off. So easily befalls us. See, the idea alluded to in this scripture is to persons putting on a raiment suitable to their character and circumstances. They put it on when it's, when, it's, when it's time to put it on in this scripture. Suitable to their character and circumstances. So let's say, for instance, uh, at seasons of rejoicing, they would put on that praise. Or, or if they're going to a wedding, they put on that garment of praise. Or, or, or if they're going to some type of celebration, they put on that garment of praise. Or, or, or anything like that. Whenever the circumstance calls for, then they would put on the garment of praise. But I'm here to tell you this morning that we have to keep that garment of praise on in seasons of sorrow, in seasons of challenges, in seasons of uncertainty, in seasons of despair, in seasons of de de depression. We got to keep on the garment of praise because that's the thing that sustains us because we are anointed. It's during those seasons that you must praise all the more your praise must shine through because the anointing empowers us to praise the anointing empowers us to praise as I close sometimes we may not feel like praising them other times we may be struggling or, or weary and we just don't praise them I gotta, gotta get a witness anybody ever, ever just didn't feel like doing it yeah Sometimes we just don't feel like it. Other times, still other times, we may feel as if God has let us down. So we decide that he doesn't deserve our praise. Oh, my. Or sometimes it may feel as though he's far off and, and doesn't really care about what's troubling us. Painful blows and losses in life may have us sent down a spiraling road. To the point where we neglect to praise him. But I'm here to tell you something this morning as I close. There's power in praise. When we make a decision to fix our eyes on the Lord. And give him daily praise. No matter what is staring us in the face. We will begin to see the struggles lose its grip over us. I say when we begin to make a decision to take our eyes off our circumstances and fix our eyes on Jesus. And to give him the praise. Those things that are shrouding us. Loosen us to the degree that we can now stand and give God praise. There's power in praising God. There's power in our acknowledgement that God is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. And when we press close to him, our hearts become in tune with the creator and the king. Praise gets the focus off ourselves and directs it back to God. I said when we praise, it gets the focus off ourselves and directs it back to God. He wants our eyes to be set firmly on him because that is where true hope is found. God is worthy of our praise no matter what we face from day to day. Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. There is power in praise. Hallelujah. Praise leaves no room for complaining and negativity. Through praise, we are focused on God, no longer allowing too much attention to be centered around our struggles. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget and all that is within me and forget not of his benefits. Who forgives your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Praise opens the way for God's blessings to take over in our lives. As we come into the presence of our king, he will not hold back his goodness. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. 
His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness is to all generations. Stand to your feet with me, if you will. <laughs> Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments. Praise him upon the cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We praise you for who you are. We praise you for anointing us. We praise you for keeping us. We praise you for loving us. Oh, we praise your name. Come on, come on, give God some praise in this place. It's not for me. It's not for you to show somebody else. It's about your relationship with your father. It's not about a ritual. It's about relationship. Every head bowed and every eye closed in prayer. Father, we thank you. First of all, for showing us without a shadow of doubt that if we believe on your son and accept him in our lives and the Holy Spirit is allowed to come in that we are anointed thank you God that the anointing is not something to be afraid of or not something to shy away from the anointing is that very thing that can save our lives in time of need. It's the anointing that tells us to go right instead of left when going right can be when we can lose our lives. That's the anointing. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, even right now, if there are those in this place who still don't understand or don't know or don't recognize the anointing that's in their life, I pray for them in Jesus' name. <laughs> know you the pardon of your grace the power of your spirit